So first we say bye, and then I say hello, and thank you all this evening for um, making it to our virtual speaker series. Tonight's presentation is by Mark Okrant, who um, is thankfully right there on the screen, Professor Emeritus. I was going to say author because he has written a book or two. Um, and this evening, he is going to uh, talk a bit about one of the subjects that um, he wrote about. And Mark, I'll let you take it from there. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, thank you for hosting me, Leah. Uh, thank goodness you, uh, you know how to handle all this technology. Otherwise, we'd all be in trouble. So um, tonight's uh, talk is called As One Era Ends, Another Begins. And what we're really going to be doing is looking at a favorite topic of mine, which is the motel. Um, the idea here will be to uh, take us through a, a, a period of time where there are transportation changes going on, which in turn impact the way people move about from one place to another, and that in turn impacts on lodging accommodations. So really this is all about change. And um, we uh, can say with, with clarity that uh, natural landforms change. I mean, all we have to do is look at this and then look at that. Uh, the fact of the matter is no one uh, before May 3rd of 2003 would have expected that kind of change to happen. Well, if something that takes millions of years to develop can change literally overnight, we shouldn't be surprised that cultural landscapes change as well. Uh, for those of you who uh, like to get things defined for them, let's, let's just say that when I talk about a landscape, I'm talking about something that's an imprint or evidence of people's activity on the, the, on the, the surface of the earth. Uh, we look at landscapes to understand our past, our present, and where the future is going. Uh, because there's a lot of time and money that goes into uh, building landscapes, when they change, obviously, uh, it's an indication that something about the culture that created it is changing as well. In the case of travel, tourism, and hospitality, we're going to go through just a, uh, a couple of phases. Uh, we'll start off by looking quickly at the railroad and carriage phase. Back um, before the, uh, well before the turn of the last century, uh, the railroad was the way in which people came from largely uh, ur urban areas uh, to New Hampshire. These people were well-to-do, affluent, if you will, and they would ride up on the train and there they would be met at a railroad station by a coach uh, or carriage rather, drawn by a, a, a team of horses. Uh, they would then go to a uh, hotel uh, inn and they would stay over for a good part of the summer. They would even, in many cases, they would even have their, their staff with them, not only their extended family, but their staff. Because the carriage was, was used to uh, transport them, this, this term, this became a term in tourism called the carriage trade. And to this day, when you talk about a, a really affluent property, a property that serves the well-to-do, we refer to it as the carriage trade. Um, as more and more affluent people came up here, the lodgings became bigger and bigger and bigger. And ultimately you had grand hotels. Usually, uh, depending on who's doing the defining, a grand hotel was referred to as any place that could house 200 or more guests in one evening. In the case of the Mount Washington, as you see here, uh, it could house about 600 people. So it was a big property. Um, the automobile comes along and it begins to change things dramatically. The landscape begins to change. Uh, affluent people did come at first by automobile. Here you see a, a, a picture of a rusting railroad track with a, with a too modern 
uh, car going by. It's the best I could do, I apologize. Um, but automobiles began to make their appearance in the White Mountains just, well, a bit before World War I, probably about 10 years. And when they did, you, uh, at first it was the affluent Americans who came here. But as they started to see more and more people from the middle class coming up here, uh, the affluent guests began to look elsewhere uh, to, uh, to do their vacationing. And along about the same time, the railroad began to fall on really hard times. It was no longer the principal way that people went from place A to place B. Um, those of you who have uh, are historians, you you will recognize you know very well that the railroad made a brief comeback around uh, around the time of World War II, largely moving soldiers from one place to another. But but for all intents and purposes, by World War I, this was a dying form of transportation. And so. Uh, I decided I would run to the uh, State Historical Society. This was before COVID, obviously. And I found a number of pieces of evidence that the automobile was here early on. And I'm not gonna bother reading these to you. We'll leave it on for a second so you can see that there are, uh, every, there's everything here from a reference to tolls, to uh, road markers, to um, travel maps uh, and highway signs. So obviously the, the, the road was in, it was, it was number one. Um, and so with these kinds of visitors coming to New Hampshire, the tourism landscape began to change. And this is a, a, actually a property uh, just north of Plymouth. Uh, it, uh, it looks like what I'm trying to show, even though this was actually a a church family that decided to add some cottages. But what happened was uh, you had people that ran farms and food lot and, uh, and uh, woodlots, and they began to see that their property was, was not providing them with the income that they wanted. And someone just said, wait, wait a minute, all these people are, tra are driving by. We can, let's try to see if we can stop them and make some money. And so they built the little kinds of little cabins that you see in this picture. Well, as time passed, someone got the idea of let's build a whole bunch of these, these things. And we had the birth of what's called the motor court in the 20s and early 30s. Um, in, the, in this case, you would have a, a little office building, probably just four walls and some glass thrown up and people would drive up, uh, see a sign, you can see here that there's a sign in front of this one that says no vacancy, so no one was gonna stop. Um, but if they saw a vacancy sign, they would stop and check in and be on their way the next morning. Um, during the 40s through, through the 60s, we say that uh, there used to be an ad on TV, TV getting there is half the fun. Well, uh, that's really, what, what happened here in New Hampshire. People began to utilize this, these new roads and these new pro lodging properties, and they would use that as a way to, to vacation. They did what was called touring travel. They start from home, stop when they got tired, um, and uh, stay over one, usually one night, get up the next morning and go. And it was a nice little, you'll pardon me for doing this, it was a circuit. Um, so instead of the kind of travel that occurred with, when the railroad was in, in play, which was destination travel, that we, that where people went from home to the place and stayed there, now people were not doing that anymore. They were traveling around. And for those of you who are approximately my age, I can't see you, so I'm not, I hope I'm not insulting anybody, uh, this is the way you took a vacation when you were uh, going along in the uh, late 40s, 50s, into the 60s. Um, so, um, so what became the, the, the go-to place was the roadside motel. This was the principal form of lodging. 
most not only for pleasure travelers, but for business travelers, traveling salesmen. I don't know how many women there were in those days doing this, but let's include them as well, would use the motel as their, their way to stay overnight and, and complete their circuit. Um, I want to define a motel for you because a lot of people misuse the term. I, what, what bothers me as a, as a motel nut, if you will, is that people will use the term hotel interchangeably with motel. They're two different things. A motel, and as you can see at the top of the screen, at least I hope you can, is a, a, a portmanteau. It's a combination of two words, those words being motor hotel. And by definition, it is a lodging with a single roof line. What they were doing in effect was connecting cabin, cabins. Um, usually they're one or two stories high. I have actually seen a, a four story one in Flagstaff, Arizona. But the idea was the guests would show up, drive the car right up to the, the door and go from the car, the car right into their room. They, there was no lobby to go into. And so people would, uh, would vacation this way. And frankly, the places began to get a, a reputation fairly early on because a lot of cheating husbands would take their girlfriends to the, to the motel because they, people never had to see the girlfriend. Um, here's an example of a motel. This is the Mount Coolidge. And I believe it's actually over the border in Lincoln. It might be Thornton. Uh, but you, here you can see that there's a parking spot literally right in front of the door. And so the person could park the car and go, it, go right into the room. That's a, this is a very traditional motel. The motels had a spatial advantage in those days. People were traveling on the old state roads and the old US highway system, which were um, maximum access. They would travel along and as they went, they would pass a motel. As you can see, there's a char little character is lying in a bed. So motels were most successful if they were along a popular byway or if they were near the attraction that people were likely to be going to. Um, there was no advertising budget in those days. There was no need to spend money putting ads in newspapers, magazines, uh, on TV or anything else. They, people simply had a sign. The sign said vacancy or no vacancy. Uh, here's one, this one would have undoubtedly been out west where they used a lot of neon for, for this kind of thing. And here you see it says motel, no vacancy. Well, if somebody checked out, they'd shut the no off and anybody coming by would see, oh, hey, there's a room and they'd pull in. Um, at the height of the motel era, we estimate that there are somewhere, were somewhere around 60,000 motels in the United States. Remember that figure, it, it, it'll come back to haunt you. Um, so what happened was that motels developed what we call a symbiotic relationship. So properties, uh, businesses doing, performing other functions would locate right near the motel, either right on the same property, right across the street, right down the road. And so there would become this nice little relationship. The traveler knew that he or she could stop their car, stay overnight. There was a place to eat right down the road. Uh, there was entertainment to be found in various forms. They could find gas uh, and uh, it was a perfect relationship. And it would have lasted forever except for one thing. And uh, well, we'll get to that in a second. When, with the motel doing as well as it was, we, we began to see changes on the landscape. We saw old businesses that were once very important, old services begin to basically rot. This, this picture that, that you see here is one of the three train stations that Bethlehem, New Hampshire operated back in the heyday of the Grand Hotels. Uh, it is, as far as I know, it's still sitting, although I don't know, standing rather, 
though I don't know how, because when I saw it, it looked like it was gonna fall down. And this shot, I probably took 15 years ago. Um, also the grand hotels began to close um, because they simply weren't, this simply was not the kind of travel that people were doing. The people that were doing this kind of travel headed down to places like Miami and among others. Uh, this is by the way, uh, I'll bet you some of you recognize was the Wentworth by the sea before uh, some of it had to be raised, some of it. So you had a new change in the tourism landscape that uh, would impact motor courts and, ho and motels. And I'll bet you some of you are a step ahead of me right now and you know that this is it. It was the interstate highway. When the interstate highway came up through here, it changed everything as far as tourism was concerned. You had, uh, I decided I, for those of you who were gonna ask me about this and, and I wasn't going to remember, I, I thought I'd better do some re research in advance. Between 61 and 77, uh, the 93 was extended from the Massachusetts border to Littleton. And that pretty much uh, completed the, uh, in the I-93 uh, roadway, uh, except for one small factor, and that was the Franconia Notch par Parkway uh, needed to be completed. And, and that finally happened in 1988. And once it did, travelers had a choice. They had a choice of veering to the left and staying on the interstate or going the old way and going back onto the old tr traditional Route 3 and going through Woods Woodstock, Lincoln, and so forth. Well, guess which way they went. I don't think there's much guessing to be done. People, pro I would say a minimum of 90% of travelers began, I mean, decided to stay on 93 and eschew the old uh, Route 3. And of course, with a tenth or less of the traffic, what does that mean? It means that uh, those businesses along, the, along Route 3 were dramatically impacted. And so now we had a return to having, to being there, being the, trend, the principal element of a vacation trip, just like it had been back in the days of the railroad. Destination travel almost entirely wiped out touring travel as the most desi desired form of a vacation trip. And so with the completion of the interstate highway, uh, of the interstate highway, the US highway systems system and the various towns, businesses, et cetera, along the route were rendered superfluous. They, they just weren't important anymore. They weren't in anybody's mind. And so it wasn't long before these kinds of businesses, uh, ones, uh, this particular shot shows both the motor court uh, idea and the, uh, the, the motel. These places were, were rendered superfluous and they were replaced by things like uh, large con condominium hotels, resort hotels, things of that nature. And in New Hampshire, we also saw the, uh, the arrival of the, the timeshare. So one other thing that I, I, I have to mention, this, I, I don't know what the name of this inn is anymore. I don't live in Plymouth anymore, but uh, this is the best inn. It's an inn or a lodge, if you will. And you might say, you might look at it and go, oh, look, people are parked right outside the, uh, the window of their room. This must be a motel. Well, no, it's not a motel because there's no door to each of these rooms. The only way to get into the property is to go through the lobby. And inside the lobby, there's usually a, a, some kind of breakfast nook or maybe even a small restaurant, but that's so different from the old motels. Um, we also had a, a, a revitalization of the, the few remaining grand hotels. 
Uh, at the time uh, I first did this study, there were four or there were three or four, depending on one's definition, in the White Mountains. You had the balsams, which may or may not come back. We certainly hope it will. Uh, you had the Mount Washington, the Mountain View Grand, and uh, there's another one called the Wentworth, which barely qualifies as a uh, as a grand hotel. And then down near the seacoast, we had you had the Wentworth by the Sea, uh, which is back and flourishing. Um, so what happened was you had another round of tourism landscapes being rendered obsolete. Uh, if you drive along in the, in the White Mountains, you're bound to see some where, where uh, the, uh, someone has taken an old uh, motor court, uh, an old cabin and tossed it in the woods. And this is undoubtedly being used to store as lawn mower and God knows what other kind of equipment. Uh, also, uh, if a place uh, went up in smoke, went up in flames, it was very seldom rebuilt. This is the, the, uh, the last remaining vestige of the, uh, the sign from the Robin's Nest Motel, which was very popular, but back in about, I'm guessing, somewhere between 77 and 80, it, the, the motel burned down and the owners saw the handwriting on the wall and they said, we're not gonna invest in this. And uh, they probably took their insurance money and ran. I don't know that for a fact, but that's probably what happened. Um, also, I would ask you to, I can't point at anything and have you see it. In this picture, I would ask you to look to the farthest left, the last tree that you can see in the foreground. And there's a, you'll see there's a stone, a bit of a stone outcrop or a stone wall. Uh, and right next to it on the ground, there's like a black stain. That is actually, I, uh, I did some digging around with my feet. That is actually uh, the remnant of the tar for a, a, a spur of Route 3 that is obviously no longer in use. So with the interstate, uh, you now have these uh, trees growing up where a road once was. Um, the impact on the motel industry, uh, in 2010, when I really got into this research heavily, there were 15,000 motels remaining in the United States. So that means that 75% of the properties uh, were lost over a 50 year period. Now, you might say, uh, what's happened? What, what's happened to the, the motel? Well, one thing that's happened is some of the properties uh, have stayed in business. They've just changed their names. And I think I have another slide in a minute that shows that. They changed their name. They eliminated the name motel because it was no longer trendy. Uh, in some cases, they became known for being short-term stays. Uh, read, if you read between the lines, in other words, that means staying for an hour or two. Uh, next, of course, a number of these properties were converted to condominium properties and apartments. Some were simply abandoned and others were demolished. I'll show you a few slides here. This is an interesting one. This, was, this is actually in Maine. It's called the Oxcart Motel in Wells. And uh, it still stands in its, in its original form. It's in beautiful condition. But I noticed one day when I was driving by that something had changed still said Oxcart Motel, but now someone had put up a fancy sign calling it the Oxcart Lane Inn. Well, it's not an inn. An inn necessitates a lobby, going through a lobby, not rooms that are uh, accessed from the outside. And then a couple of years later, this is the way it looked. Still see the sign, Oxcart Lane Inn. Now you can no longer see any reference to it having been a motel. Here's another interesting situation. Here's a motel and you look at this, if you were to drive by here, you'd say, wow, this property must be doing great. I mean, I know it's early, too early in the day for any, uh, any business, but I mean, look at the condition it's in. The roof is perfect, the, 
It's painted beautifully. The doors look like they're well labeled. Then you get close to the doors and you realize that somebody has turned it into a storage unit. Um, so what's happened is over time with transportation innovations occurring, they've impacted the kind of travel that people do and the background of the visitors themselves. Um, visitors' interests in past properties is actually being revived. We have the phenomenon, which uh, I'm sure you're familiar with, called nostalgia, where people, uh, particularly as they get into their uh, 60s and 70s and so forth, begin to have, have a longing for the old days. Uh, they want, they, they want to, to experience what was. And so here's the uh, Wentworth by the Sea. Looked like it was ready to be torn down. It's been completely renovated and people are uh, during non-COVID times filling up the rooms. I, I have stayed there. Um, I, I, uh, I write murder mysteries set at Grand Hotel properties and I, they were kind enough to put me up. And I wanna tell you the room was first rate. It's a great place. Um, also, uh, in recognition of the interstate and trying to lure people off the interstate, properties have done things like this. They put up big posters, uh, with big billboards rather, suggesting, uh, encouraging people, get off at this exit. The Pilgrim Cottages are here. And people do exactly that. They get off. Here is the Gilchrist, which is, I think, one of the sweetest little properties in, in New Hampshire. Uh, it's not only a motor court, but it, there's also a motel there. And they've used river rock to create just be these beautiful chimneys, fireplaces, uh, wood floors, the place is gorgeous. And uh, here's their sign, again, attracting people from the interstate. Um, so, Let's get back to what we are here to, to do. And what is the status of the motel today? Well, a number of properties have changed names. Uh, I did a little bit of a survey in, in a couple of places. Uh, and I found out that some places call their properties resort motels or resort hotels, which again is a misnomer. Or they simply use the term resort or they use the term in, and in some cases, they just call the place Johnson's. Now, the one thing that uh, uh, using, calling something a resort, if you have a recreation area, a swimming pool, um, a restaurant, a quality restaurant that serves at least two meals, if not three a day, then you have the right to call yourself a resort. But if it's, if it's a simple, little uh, one-story place along the side of the road, that's not a resort, it's a lie. It's, 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 faulty, it's faulty advertising. Um, but what this tells us is that the designation motel has really lost its uh, advertising power. It's not luring people the way it once did. Uh, what's happened is the motel, dating back to the time of Bonnie and Clyde, has had an image problem. In some cases, today, it's regarded as old fashioned. People go, oh God, that's what my parents and grandparents stay in. I don't wanna stay in that. In other cases, it's regarded as cheap because a number of people have bought these properties. They put very little effort into them. Uh, they don't even uh, uh, try to control smoking in the rooms and there's nothing worse for a non-smoker to check into a room and have it absolutely stink of cigarette smoke. And in other cases, they're, uh, they're honky-tonk. I mean, they're places that are, are being uh, occupied by people that uh, travelers don't necessarily want to be involved with. Um, can motels be saved? Well, they can. There are various ways to do this. Uh, one way in, in which they're being saved is by creating what's called love motels. Uh, three, uh, two countries and one territory 
uh, do this today. Uh, he, they're very popular in Brazil. They're very popular in Korea and in Puerto Rico. And so I thought that you might find it interesting to know how a love motel works. And so I checked into one. Um, don't get too excited by this. It's not, it, it's not a very interesting story. This is uh, the Motel Hemini, uh, just outside of Rincon, Puerto Rico. You drive down a gorgeous, gorgeous uh, driveway that's tree-lined, and you come into this area that looks like a bunch of garages. And the golf carts, by the way, are the managers. So how he gets from one room to the next. You, you drive up to, you keep driving along until you come to a garage door that's open like this one. And so I did. I drove up, in, drove into the garage. There's a button on the inside because after all, the idea is to maintain anonymity at these places. And so I hit the, door, hit the, uh, the button, the garage door came down and once it did, I was free to go into um, the, uh, the motel. Uh, lest you get think that this is about to become an exciting story, um, here we are in the motel. Um, as you would expect, uh, mirrors, floor to ceiling mirrors. I would not recommend you ever using that bed. Um, and uh, here, this is, uh, well, I'm there. My wife is photo took, my wife took this picture and this is uh, my daughter and her husband. Uh, and so an exciting time was not had by any, but uh, we, we got, I wanted to be able to write about this stuff. I, I, I think Puerto Rico has 39 of them. So that's one way in which motels have been uh, preserved. Another is uh, we have a population in this country uh, of people from the country of India who uh, have come here and have bought up a large number of motel and even hotel properties. In fact, 50, more than 50% of all US motels these days are operated by Indian Americans. The old, um, what was it called, the red carpet? Uh, Deep River, it was called in the old days, red carpet on Highland Street. Uh, has been owned by, I think, one or two different families. Uh, that if, you, if you find that the owner's name is Patel, uh, generally speaking, uh, this is what we're talking about. By the way, the Patels also own the Wyndham chain, uh, and that's largely hotels. So if we're going to save motels, there has to be sufficient demand coming in off the roads to uh, make this work. Um, there are a number of properties, everything that was on that earlier list from lodgings to dinings to recreation businesses, et cetera, that are, are, have been suffering because the, the, there are fewer people go using them. And so their likelihood of of achieving another generation is minimalized. And so I asked the question and I'm answering it here, what's the answer? How do you save these places? And the answer lies in functionality. You need to give travelers a reason to use the old highways rather than take the interstates. You've got to give them a reason to get off the highway system. And so um, I asked the question, what can be done to save the state's motels? And I will tell you that I came up with an answer and I was starting to implement it. But when I retired, uh, my group just sort of dissipated and a lot of them have now retired. But I'm happy to share that with you uh, if you are so interested. And so, I, that really brings me to the end of my planned comments. Well, that's that's great. Thanks. It's fun. I actually um, wasn't 
sure. I didn't realize that you were focusing so much on, on New England and New Hampshire. So that's kind of fun to see some of those old photos, you know, motels. Definitely. I remember being a kid and what is the difference between a motel and a hotel? And, and I figured it out at some point. Um, but we don't, you know, think about it. I guess it's been a long time since I've done um, long drives, but it would be interesting to pay attention and note what is there and what isn't anymore. So, um, my, my uh, book, uh, which is called No Vacancy, The Rise, Demise, and Reprise of Motels, actually looks at uh, motel properties all, all over the country. Uh, I interviewed past guests, past, past managers, and uh, uh, went to uh, communities from coast to coast, literally, from Maine, New Hampshire, Illinois, Arizona, California. Um, so this talk, I, I pared down for, for this group. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Well, if um, anyone has any questions or comments, we can open it up now and I'll do my best. I see Lori there. So Lori, go for it. Oh, I'm dying to know the answer. What can be done to save the state's motels? <laughs> well, I'm so happy you asked, Lori. <laughs> we, um, what, what I designed some years ago was something called the retro tour. The idea was we were we linked a lot, uh, motel properties with um, everything from uh, attractions, roadside attractions, to uh, old-fashioned restaurants and diners, to candy stores, from literally from uh, I would say Laconia Weirs to Littleton. And we were, we really were going great guns on this. Um, unfortunately, I um, went off on a sabbatic. And while I was gone, someone tried to hijack the group uh, to make money off of them. And everybody got turned off. And that was the end of it. But there are still people out there that are interested in doing this. The idea that, then would be for each property to call itself a retro tour property. They would fly a retro tour flag. There would be a, a, a historic poster showing how the place came to be and uh, how uh, it had changed architecturally uh, in terms of design, interior design and so forth. Um, the purists in the group wanted to really make it uh, a throwback and not allow any internet. And I, no, that's not a good idea. That's not going to sell. But, but that's, that was the idea. And I, I'm convinced it still could happen. I know the people, for example, at Clark's are very interested in, in seeing this happen. And they, of course, would be a centerpiece. Yeah, tying everything together like that does make a lot of sense for, for marketing and for people, you know. Sure. As the destination in itself, not just as a place to stay. That's that exactly right. You, yeah. you turn it into a destination. Yeah. Yeah. You want a job, uh, Leah? I mean... <laughs> you know, I think I was trying to remember staying in motels, and I definitely did, you know. Um, and I think they were really great uh, bike touring. And because it's so easy, you just line up the, the bikes next to the door and you go on in and not have to deal with anything or anyone. And yeah. That's, a, yeah. that's a, a perfect group. It's made for motels. Yeah. And I don't, maybe in Vermont, they've done something with that, but I don't think we have here in New Hampshire. Yeah, if so, I don't know. Yeah, it's fun to... They're very popular with motorcycle groups, too, on bike tours. And we always see motorcycles lined up because you've got all your gear in various packs on the motorcycle that don't carry well through a hotel lobby. And you have to keep going back and forth to the bike or motorcycle. And so out west, I've seen them be very popular with motorcyclists. They actually 
would prefer a motel over anything else. You're absolutely correct. And in fact, if you know anyone that runs a motel in the Weir's Beach area, they'll tell you that they do better than 50% of their business during that one week. Yeah. So it's gone, did you say nationwide from 60,000 to 15,000? Is that what you heard? That 15 is an old count. It might even be fewer than that. Huh. That's interesting. Just yeah, I, I, if I were to guess, I'd say that we're probably more, a little bit north of 10,000, but south of 15. Well, I know, I know, I, I kind of want to think about it, but <laughs> just, just imagining the difference in the, in the landscape, what it looks like, even, you know, from the last time that I was out and about on the, in the country, in the roadsides, I mean, it's been 20 years in that too, so it would be interesting if I would, if I would notice that, and really, you think it's the, dest the destination piece that people aren't driving to and from in the same way? Absolutely. And, and, and people don't even think to look for them. I, I uh, had a, a group of students who uh, I was talking to about motels, and uh, a number of them said, you know, I drive down Route 3 all the time. I never even realized those properties were there. So they don't even think about them anymore. Mm. Well, a lot of them have looked a little shoddy in, you know. Yes. Maybe always, but maybe now we have this aesthetic expectation, you know, that they don't necessarily fulfill. But, you know, your your book cover was just so, you know, I was like, it's so retro, <laughs> you know, and, and very nostalgic for sure. That's it was fun to, to see that it just was didn't I didn't realize how much I associate with that kind of, uh, you know, font and signage. So. Are there other questions? Yeah, I think. Have you oh. ever thought about narrowing it down to just the motels between on the old Route Three between Plymouth and Woodstock? I think I, I ride my bike on that road, and I often look at them and wonder the histories of the generations of families that run that had run them, and 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 all, how almost all of them are completely run down now. Sadly, that's true. That that. That section is, um, is, it's just a shame. Makes me very sad. Yeah. But I, I thought that would be, I always thought that would be an interesting coffee table book because as you said, we're all interested in the, that nostalgia. I remember staying at motels like that when I was a little kid. Um, but, you know, now we would never think of saying, you know, because we, we <laughs> the interstate, we actually, we just drove 22 hours from Boston to Florida nonstop. So that was 95 all the way. So I'm definitely guilty as charged. <laughs> well, the, if, if I were a good salesman, I would tell you that the book is readily available. But since I'm not a good salesman, <laughs> I won't say that. <laughs> well, I think I'm just saying that maybe you have another book <laughs> just in that one stretch along the old Route 3 in New Hampshire. Uh, these days, I, I write uh, a series of murder mysteries. Oh, <laughs> right, which, which initially when we were talking with Mark, he was thinking that it might be time for him to, to share that presentation, but apparently your, your publisher said, hold off a bit. Is that the way the story goes? Well, that was the story, but everything's done now. So oh. they're out. Excellent. Well, we- Congratulations. Yeah, hopefully we'll have Mark back um, another time and talk a little bit about that that series too. So, yeah, thank you. That was interesting. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. And again, um, Mark, thank you for your yeah. time. Thanks. It was really interesting. Yeah, and no, thank have you a very much. Appreciate good it. evening, yeah. everyone. This um, presentation is recorded, so you can take a look at uh, it at any time it's viewable on our website and i look forward to seeing you all in the future thank okay you. bye right. everyone thank you bye. bye bye thank you you're welcome